Do you agree with anybody who comes up with the sentence he was to blame for being knifed in broad daylight 15 times in his neck? But if you're asking me who was to blame, I say the assailant, much like Douglas Murray said that the Christchurch killer, the one who massacred the, the Muslims what a in the mosque, you are. but only the killer was to blame, not those who radicalized you him into... You are about to witness a thought-provoking debate between Douglas Murray, a staunch defender of free speech, and Abdullah al-Andalusi, focusing on the aftermath of the Salman Rushdie incident. In this heated debate, Murray emphasizes the sacrosanct nature of free speech, challenging the notion of its limits in light of provocative art and literature. So for us tonight, there's one big question. Is there such a thing as too much free speech, or should we always defend the right to offend? Now, joining me from New York, I'm joined by conservative author Douglas Murray. Uh, to quote Piers Morgan, Douglas, has the world gone nuts, my friend? You said at the beginning, is there any limit to free speech? And I'm rather disturbed we're still discussing this. It's three decades more since the Satanic Verses affair. It was in 1989 that the Ayatollah Khomeini did the unpardonable, unforgivable thing of calling for the murder of a British novelist for the crime of writing a novel. And we had these debates back then. Uh, Oh, where are the limits to free speech? Has Mr. Rushdie committed a crime as well as the Ayatollah and a lot more guff like that? I'm rather disturbed that in all of the decades since, with all of the people who've been killed for asserting their right to free speech and asserting their right to say what they think and, to, and to, for the rest of us to hear it, that we're still at this elementary playground level of discussion. I'm sorry to say that, but this is a long, long answered question. Our societies have perfectly good uh, incitement laws in place. The rest of it, I'm sorry, no, we're not adapting our own uh, speech codes. We're not going to make ourselves more sensitive to people who famously burn books that they can't even read. I mean, the Ayatollah Khomeini had never even read the satanic verses when he asked for Muslims around the world to kill Salman Rushdie. It's an unpardonable thing that has happened it is extraordinary to me that we're still having this discussion. Mm -hmm. We had the same discussion seven years ago when the cartoonists of Charlie Hebdo were being murdered. We had the same discussion in all of these decades, and it's Muslims and non-Muslims who've been attacked, and we in the West still have this pathetic discussion about, oh, what are the limits of free speech? Really, we've got to get better than that. Um, Douglas, I agree with you, but it's not just Islam, is it? We'll talk to uh, Abdul al-Andalusi in a minute, but... It's also comedy. We talked about Dave Chappelle, we talked about Jimmy Carr. There doesn't seem to be a week that goes by without some comedian making a joke that a certain group, a certain uh, number of people find distasteful. I, I obviously well, that come, might be true. Well, well, I obviously come from a different planet, because here's what I would say. We have an on-off button. If you want to go and see a comedian, you buy a ticket. If you want to watch a television program, you pick that channel. If you want to read Salman Rushdie's book, you surely have a right. Are we not getting to the point where free speech is under attack in our world, in well, our course, nation? It's been, but it's, well, it's been under attack for a long time. I don't particularly care for a lot of the sort of um, belly aching and complaining on rather frivolous online stuff that I hear from a lot of authors and others. I think that people have to toughen up a bit on some of that. Uh, but this, the Rushdie affair has always been in a different class, and there's a reason for that. And there's a reason why so many people today are willing to make death threats against authors and others for all sorts of things, including comedians. And it's because they saw that it works. Yeah. It works. When the Ayatollah called for the murder of Salman Rushdie, people on the left and right of British politics and of British culture made excuses for the fatwa. I'm sure we'll hear some excuses today. They learned our societies learned that if somebody says i'm offended and then says and as a result i'm going to kill you better be damn sure that you're willing to die for that and unfortunately the success of the ayatollah's fatwa among other things is that it showed a load of other disgruntled people what they could do if they only had the had the disgustingness to think that they could exercise violence uh, uh, as an op opposition to the pen. And I'm afraid that what happened, as I say, is that Muslim extremists across the UK and across the world showed they could intimidate people, and others undoubtedly have learned from this. But let's remember, 
Britain in 1989, we allowed Muslims in Bradford to burn the Quran, to burn sort of the satanic verses on the streets of Britain. We allowed prominent figures like Cat Stevens to excuse the murder of Salman Rushdie on the television. We allowed Iranian officials who had called for Rushdie's murder to live in London. Like, how stupid are we? Interesting, Douglas. Thank you for now, New York. Let's pick up now with journalist Martha Gill, uh, Emma Wedd from the Free Speech Union, co-founder of the Muslim Debate Initiative, Abdullah al-Andalusi. Uh, let's start with you, if we can, Abdullah. Um, quite a strong rhetoric from Douglas Murray. Um, I'm always aware that Muslim extremists do not in any way speak for the majority of Muslims, but to be fair, the Iranian government over the weekend said Rushdie was to blame for being attacked. That is completely and utterly despicable, isn't it? Well, firstly, um, I find it rather uh, strange that Douglas Murray, who's had a history of advocating for restrictions on Muslim speakers at universities... He, but you he can didn't... answer my question. Do know, you think know, it's despicable that, that, that the Iranian if, if, government if, if, have said that, that he took it on himself? He was I, stabbed in broad daylight. Do I you know, find if that I, despicable? If, but if I may, um, he, he deigns to say he's a champion for free speech, so to speak, but yet he, his organization argued for restrictions on, uh, for platforms for Muslim speakers going to <sighs> universities he wanted to ban the burqa in public buildings and, you, and a kind of social ban on it in public. Um, so you for him, and, and, and argued that, Muslim, uh, hold on, that hold conditions on. for Muslims in Europe must be made harder across the board. Let, let's Why bring Douglas back in. Douglas, that, Douglas, wait. I find it a little, I, I would, I find it a little bit strange that he should um, deign to call himself, um, brazenly call himself, some, or at least imply he's some kind of champion for free speech. Free look, I've probably got to answer that. You'll have noticed, and all of your viewers will have noticed, that this Islamist lunatic in your studio can't answer the basic question. Let's try it again and make it simple for you. Why oh. don't you say whether or not you are completely condemning of any violence against Salman Rushdie or anyone else who is deemed to have said something heretical? Why don't we start with the basics for you? Okay, firstly, I want to answer his question, because he asked me first, which is about the Iranian regime. Well, having, having not been an Iranian citizen, nor participated in any elections to elect the Iranian regime, the Iranian regime doesn't really represent 1.8 billion Muslims. And okay, so if you're here representing 1.8 billion Muslims, um, it's very simple. Douglas um, has just said it. Do I'm you, do you, anyone. Do, or I, as your own self, having heard what he said, yeah. do you accept people saying, be it the Iranian government or Muslim extremists, and I made the caveat and I repeat it, Muslim extremists, that one of the biggest problems I have is that people look at the whole thing and they shouldn't. Do you agree with anybody who comes up with the sentence, he was to blame for being knifed in broad daylight 15 times in his neck. Do you? The only person to blame for the knifing of uh, Salman Rushdie is the, um, the assailant himself. Not the, not the Iranian regime who put the fatwa on him in the first place. Well, unless you can, unless you can demonstrate that they were specifically colluding or they sent an agent to They said he was so, to blame. To the, he was in communication with the Iranian and that, Revolutionary and, and Guard. That's, and that's their opinion, right? But I'm only here to talk about, if you're asking me, who is to blame? I say the assailant, much like Douglas Murray said that the Christchurch killer, the one who massacred the, the Muslims in the mosque, you are. but only the what killer was to blame, not those who radicalised him into viewing no, Muslims as a threat to the West. Is, what you'll find is that if somebody put millions of dollars on someone's head, yours for instance, or mine, and somebody then attacked us, you would think that the person who put millions of dollars on our head would bear some responsibility. Yep. But because you're such a dishonest weasel, you're not even willing to do that. You're not even willing to do the basic thing of condemning the attack. S sticks and stones, Douglas Murray, sticks and stones. Why right? don't we you need to demonstrate that the that. person, the person was motivated by the reward. I'll tell you what I'd like to motivate. In an era where the boundaries of free expression are constantly tested, Douglas Murray's argument stands as a beacon of clarity. He posits that the response to Salman Rushdie's, the satanic versus a fat way calling for Rushdie's death, exemplifies a dangerous inclination to suppress dissenting voices under the guise of protecting religious sentiments. Murray's critique extends beyond this singular event, touching on a systemic issue within modern discourse, the conflation of criticism with blasphemy, and the subsequent justification of violence as a means of silencing opposition. The debate spotlights the critical distinction between speech that is merely offensive to some and speech that constitutes direct harm or incitement to violence. Murray emphasizes that while societies have established legal frameworks to address direct threats and incitement, the subjective perception of offense should not serve as a basis to curtail freedom of expression. 
Drawing from Murray's insights, it becomes evident that the defense of free speech is not merely about protecting the rights of the individual, but about preserving the foundational principles of a free and open society. He underscores the danger of capitulating to demands for censorship based on subjective offense, highlighting how such concessions can erode the very fabric of democratic discourse. Murray's arguments resonate with the views of other prominent thinkers and defenders of free speech. For instance, John Stuart Mill, in his seminal work on liberty, argued that silencing an opinion is essentially robbing humanity, posterity as well as the existing generation, those who dissent from the opinion still more than those who hold it. Mill's assertion that the clash of ideas is necessary for the discovery of truth underscores Murray's defense of free speech as a catalyst for societal growth and understanding. Recent surveys and studies have highlighted a growing concern regarding the erosion of free speech rights globally. According to Freedom House, there has been a notable decline in global freedom, including the freedom of expression, over the last decade. This decline underscores the timeliness and relevance of Murray's call to action. The defense of free speech is not just an academic or ideological stance, but a pressing necessity in the face of increasing attempts to curtail these freedoms, whether through government censorship, social media regulation, or societal pressure to conform to majority viewpoints.